Welcome to the Technology Management Programs Lecture Series here at UCSB. And I am honored to introduce our speaker. He's a new media entrepreneur by the name of John Hartman. He has 50 years experience in the entertainment industry uh, with giving career direction to such stars as Sonny and Cher, Peter, Paul and Mary, Crosby, Stills and Nash, The Eagles and many others. Um, he is a lecturer at Loyola Marymount in the Recording Arts Program where his students voted him Professor of the Year for 2007. And um, his most recent enterprise is a website called theholodime.com, uh, which uh, it's an online artist management community that directly develops and searches out for the next, uh, next generation of stars. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our lecturer, John Hartman. It's a privilege and an honor to be here with you. And when uh, the good doctors, um, Grant and Hanson, invited me to come, I was very excited, and uh, I went home and I, I wrote out a, a, a lecture of the 10,000 things that I'd love to tell you about my 50 years in show business. I know I don't look that old, but I started at 17. <clears throat> I was selling librettos in the Gilbert and Sullivan Festival Theater in Monmouth, Maine, uh, in what we call summer stock. And uh, I was uh, introduced to a New York company that came there every summer, and they were all professionals, and I was totally fascinated. And, Never got out of mind and always pursued the career. I spent a few years in college, but I immediately uh, went off to Hollywood to be an actor. And um, when I landed at the corner of Hollywood and Vine, I, I was instantly struck with the uh, stark realization that all neophyte actors uh, experience when they, when they go to the big city to try to compete in the most competitive environment in the world. And what, what strikes you is that uh, even if you were the big frog back on campus, uh, what you're facing now in Hollywood is there's a lot of big frogs here. And that's uh, a scary moment. And the other thing that you experience immediately is that you're totally, totally lost in the fog of show business. It is a foreign place. And for someone entering it for the first time, believe me, it's daunting. Uh, you, you do not where, know where to go. You do not know how the game of show business is played. You are at the mercy of um, circumstances beyond your control. So when I, when I got this opportunity, I went home and I, and I realized there were 10,000 things I wanted to tell you. And I sat down at my computer and I, I started writing and I wrote up all the stuff I wanted to say. And, and uh, when I read it back, it was three hours long. <laughs> I went, wow, that's not going to work. So I got out the old editing and, and uh, scratched out a bunch, and I reduced it down to uh, two hours. Now, uh, I have to cram it all into one. So what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tear up half the notes, and um, I'm going to uh, suggest that, well, I have to tell you, uh, I've recently been diagnosed with Halfheimer's. Now, I'm grateful it's not the dreaded Alzheimer's, but it does take me twice as long to remember half as much. So if I rip up half the notes, I should be able to wing it right into just the perfect amount of time to accomplish it on schedule. So uh, I need a volunteer, because I'm going to rip up these notes. But I need a volunteer. You can stay at your seat. It's going to be real easy. Someone with a big voice. Brittany, you'll have to do it. OK, Brittany, I'm, on three, I want you to yell this out as loud as you dare. I do not believe in gravity. OK? okay. You ready? One, two, three. I do not believe in gravity. Gravity does not care what you believe. <laughs> it exists anyway. The first law of entrepreneuring is don't be afraid to make a mess because nothing is perfect. Your most astute plan will not work out the way you planned it. By being in motion, you will be following a path and a trajectory, and you uh, will achieve a consequence. But it may not be anything close to what you dreamed when you created your entrepreneurial enterprise. But don't worry. Th there's, a, there's a system and there's a plan. And um, what, what entrepreneuring requires is that you have an idea. It comes first from an idea. It's born in the mind. And it is nurtured by your desire. And it leans toward the idea that if you um, execute that plan, and you create a product, and you create distribution, and you market it, that you are now competing. The hard part of playing this game is the financing. 
I've had a million ideas, and I'll never run out. And I'll explain to you in a little bit why. And, but the fact is, getting the funding to execute your plan is the hardest part of the game. And I've had enterprises that um, were underfunded going in, and, and we worked on for seven years, and they crashed and burned for lack of the funding to keep them afloat. So since um, the goal is to create a brand and create this distribution and achieve status and market share, what uh, you are really going to measure here is your success will be based on quality, duration. It'll be based on primarily profit. Now, every company that goes into business does not have to be purchased by Microsoft for a billion dollars. That, that's the extraordinary exception. But what a company is supposed to do when you dream it up and you put your life's work behind it is you want to make a living. You want to survive. You want to pay the cost of being in that business. And you want to realize enough profit to pay your rent, your phone, your family's bills and needs and so forth. And if you just to see, uh, achieve that amount of success, then, then you're winning. You're succeeding at, at the game, the game of entrepreneuring. Now, I, I spent my life in the game of show business. And uh, it's a very fascinating place. It's very unforgiving. It is a uh, team sport. And uh, errors are costly. If a personal manager makes a mistake, his artist's career can suffer, sometimes irme immeasurably and irrevocably. Careers die easily. You've all seen in, in recent years uh, one hit wonders come along and you know their name for a minute, and you never know the names of the people in the band because you don't get to know them that intimately. But they come, they, you hear this song, and then they disappear, and you never hear them again, and you probably wonder what happened to them. Well, what happens to them is they get a day job, and they, and they are no longer in show business. Uh, sometimes that taste, uh, that, that glorious taste of victory in, in this very competitive world is enough to keep people in it forever. And they may not succeed at their chosen profession, but they could um, grow into some other of the core professions, of which they're in entertainment, there are eight core professions. So in a minute, I'm going to tell you about that. But just keeping the entrepreneurial issue at hand, I, I wanna, I'm not going to dwell on finance. It's terrible. It's horrible. It's the toughest part. The way you get financing for any given product is through your sales pitch. It's a pitch. And if you're out describing your business to a potential investor, then the key is to have a good pitch. And to have a good pitch, you have to be factual, and you have to be emotional, you have to be intellectual, you have to be um, visionary. You have to see into the future. We've all heard the great story of how Babe Ruth um, called a home run for a kid dying in the hospital. And he, and he told the kid, when I point to the flag, this home run's for you. And he came to bat, and he pointed to the flag, and he hit the home run. He predicted the future, and he delivered the future. If you do not take the risks, you will not achieve the reward. Not only did Babe Ruth for decades hold the record for the highest number of home runs slugged out of the park, but he also held the record for the highest number of strikeouts. Now, that what that tells you is that Babe Ruth was willing to take a chance. He was willing to risk striking out and the implications of that in the record books in order to get the most opportunities to hold the record for the most home runs. Since it all begins in the mind, it's important to understand how the mind works. Our minds have five basic functionalities. There is perception. That which you believe to be true, that is actually true. There is misperception. That which you believe to be true, which is not true. There is memory, that part of the past that lives in the present. There is imagination, that part of the future that lives in the present. And most important of all, there is sleep, where we go to reshuffle the deck, to explore the infinite consciousness that we all share and to devise the solutions to the problems that you face tomorrow. Your bad dream is, a, is not a nightmare. Your bad dream is your mind 
addressing a serious issue for you that is essentially going to be resolved in the morning because that's what your brain does and your brain is this incredibly giant computer and each of us has one and in a sense because we are all connected by our minds it's our minds that allow us to see each other to experience the same colors the same motion the same actions in the room and if you consider it in a psycho cybernetic sense we are all one thing we are all connected at the mind level and therefore each of our individual computers when you put them all together create the big mainframe in the sky this is a phenomenal reality and it has enormous implications and we'll address those in a minute but for the, this moment consider that we've probably all heard the old wives tale that our, our, mind, our minds are like icebergs that they're 90% underwater and we're only using 10%. You all heard that? Some of you have. It's what we call an old wives tale. Let's consider for the moment, let's put that iceberg part, the 90% to use, just, just for the, tonight. So in, just mentally go inside this giant huge iceberg and this is your mind now, this is your infinite mind. It, it, it is not limited by size. So imagine your iceberg to be incredibly huge and go into it and carve out a big huge cube right in the middle, just a big open space. Okay, now we'll just call that the ice box. And uh, momentarily we're gonna enter the ice box and we're gonna add some elements that will uh, speed up the process and allow me to tell you through the idea that a picture is worth a thousand words. And, I'll, and I've uh, scratched on the board behind the screen a, a bunch of, and I mean scratched, <laughs> a bunch of stuff that I'm going to talk to you about and this and then and then here is going to be an image that you can insert into that ice box and that image if you keep it it will give you a permanent kind of vision about how the entertainment industry works and whether you are an observer of, of entertainment or if you are a, a participant in the manufacture of it or the creation of the art itself uh, it all works in the same fashion and most people have no clue about how entertainment works, yet everyone's involved. And entertainment is a vast arena. Uh, it has, of course, movies, TV, film, music, uh, video games, sports, uh, car racing, you name it. There, there's a lot of entertainment out there. And the reason for that is because we demand it. As human beings, we, we have four basic instincts. We have... Um, Consumption. You take your first breath, you take water, you take food, you use up stuff. We're consumers. We also have propagation. That's sex. You've tried it, you like it, and you want more. <laughs> we also have contention. Contention, competition. It starts with the phenomenon known as sibling rivalry. I'll tell you a little story. When my uh, son was born, we had had the habit of our daughter sleeping in bed with us. She was now 22 months old. We're coming home with her infant brother. And we put him in bed with us because that was how we did it. We all slept in the same bed. 22 months old, she looks down at the new guy and says, no, who's this guy? You know, what's he doing in my place? Sibling rivalry, it's instinctive. It's early and it carries you into the rest of your contentious nature, which then goes on to the ball field, the classroom, eventually the sports uh, pavilions and, uh, and further into it, uh, business. And, you know, dreadfully, but current, war. We're fighters. It's one fourth of our instinct. Now, the subject that I want to speak to you about tonight in, in the context of entrepreneuring and society is the fourth instinct. Anybody know what it is? Okay, this is 25% of all human activity. Dreaming. Dreaming is part of sleep. Invention is part of the creative process. We'll get to that. What the fourth instinct is, is entertainment. As I mentioned earlier, entertainment is huge to us. We spend probably more money on it than anything else. We devote more time to it. We are completely engrossed in it, and we don't know how it works. So what I'm going to teach you here tonight is how it works, how the inner 
entertainment game is played. And as I said, we all start out lost in the fog of Hollywood. As a young actor, alone in the street, I was scared to death because I did not know what to do, where to turn. How was I going to get one job as an actor? And uh, I struggled for a year or so, and, and well, after a lot of rejection, and, and frankly, I don't, I don't suffer rejection well. <laughs> you know, when they said, the job's not for you, I, I went, what are you talking about? You know, I did a great reading. <laughs> so in pursuit of that, I um, lied about my training as an actor and went and applied to the mailroom of the, of the William Morris Agency. I was there two days. I said, I can do this better than any of these guys, and started running for the goal. Six months later, I was the fastest guy in the mailroom, and they sent me to uh, work for Colonel Tom Parker, the manager of Elvis Presley. This was at the height of the King's movie career, and I got to see this amazing manager, probably the greatest of all time, and his incredible client at the highest possible level of the music industry. And my fascination with movies and TV and acting completely disappeared. I was now enthralled and enchanted by the music industry itself, having stood on top of the mountain and looked downward past Elvis and his enormous success. So the um, music business goes back thousands of years to when guys pounded on logs in caves and other guys took chickens at the door. And when though th that guy pounding on the logs was the first artist, and the guy who was collecting the chickens was the first personal manager. And when they sent their emissary over to the next valley where they heard there was this big cave and a lot of chickens, that guy was the first booking agent. The guy who owned and controlled the cave was the first concert producer what we call in the vernacular of the trade, promoter. The producer of live events in showbiz is called a promoter. That ancient fraternity has built the infrastructure over thousands of years of what show business has become. And, and all other aspects of show business really are barnacles on the infrastructure that was created to market live music. And that's been going on for hundreds, thousands of years, literally. A hundred years ago, when the um, phonograph was invented, the records that were for sale prior to that were made of paper. They were called sheet music. And uh, they were sold on uh, the sidewalk outside of music instrument stores by a guy tinkering on a piano and playing the new song that came out of Tin Pan Alley that was mentioned in that film clip as the source of all the great songwriting of the era. And um, the people, this is the late 1800s. The people are walking up and down the street, are listening to this guy play the piano, and they come over, and if they like that song, they spend a dime, and they buy that sheet music, and they go home with it, and that night after dinner, the family gathers, which that's an anomaly today, around the parlor piano, and they perform and sing this song together. And it's one of the most important things in, in the social culture of the time. Now, when Edison invented the phonograph, that made it a whole com different ballgame because the music became a cheaper, a, a phonograph was much cheaper than a piano, and um, the object that cr carried the music was no longer paper, it was made of very fragile acetate that broke all the time. And there's still um, clauses in heinous recording contracts with major companies today that carry breakage clauses. They automatically deduct money from your earnings for breakage, which, of course, doesn't occur, occur with CDs. <laughs> they're not breaking. But they're still charging the artist for breakage fees. And there's all kinds of other elements about record contracts that are very, very terrible and very anti-artist and I think contribute greatly to the idea that your generation feels it's perfectly okay to steal music. I, mean, I know you all download and you're not quitting. Um, <laughs> And, and that's okay in a sense, but what justifies that in your mind, I find from my students, is that uh, this is this big corporation. They're ripping off the artists anyway. We're not really stealing from the artists. We're stealing from them and to hell with them. It's kind of a Robin Hood syndrome. So when Edison's phonograph came along and records started to be a thing, it was really more about selling the phonographs than the product that was being used on the phonograph. In the modern record business that was born out of the marriage of AM radio 
single records, and Elvis Presley was the star, that was about selling records, one song at a time. It evolved into the postmodern record business was about the marriage of FM radio, albums, and the Beatles were the star. The future of this industry depends on the marriage of the internet and the concept of free music. The music becoming a lost leader, not the product that's sold. This, of course, has caused the demise of the postmodern record industry, which was based on the idea that if you really wanted this one song we've promoted at a very high cost, you have to buy an album with 10 other songs that you don't want. Okay, well, if you're stealing the music, you're not going to steal anything you don't want. So all you're going to steal by peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and MP3 downloading and piracy, as it's called in the music business, the future is going to belong to the guy who can consummate that marriage and monetize the new paradigm. Because the record sales were what were paying huge money to the publishers and huge money to the artists and precipitating the energy among the fan base that provoked live concert attendance. So in order to know where we're headed with all this future of music, it's important to understand where we've been, where we are now, and then we can uh, envision where it's going to go in the future. And since entrepreneuring is a product of vision, because if you, I have a, a series of laws that I teach my students called Hartman's Law, 100 Rules of Show Business. And one of them is, if you go on what's happening today, it'll be over before you catch up. Because the music industry moves so fast that if you're emulating something that's successful and popular today, by the time you establish your career, write your songs, make your records, and promote them in the marketplace, that, that's gone on to something else. There's a whole new genre of possibility or a whole new focus on long-time existing genres. The most prolific and lucrative genre today is country music. Uh, it's very few hip-hop artists filling stadiums, but a lot of country artists fill stadiums. So the big box office grows there. And there's also less likelihood for piracy in that genre because their fans are, A, probably not as computer savvy, <laughs> and B, because they carry an incredible affection for their artists. I would not have stolen music from the Beatles no matter what, no matter how easy it was. I would not have stolen music from Elvis Presley no matter how easy it was. I would not have stolen uh, from the other party that I was a fan of. I've only been a fan three times. I wouldn't have stolen from Humphrey Bogart if he recorded, but he didn't. So this affection that fans can have toward their artists, this is really a form of love. It's um, inspired by sex appeal. It's inspired by um, charisma. Music itself, which is the mathematics of the masses. Music is something that we all have in common. And even when you couldn't understand the lyrics of a song in a foreign language, you can understand the feel of uh, the tempo and uh, the melody. There are three M's in songwriting that I talk to my students about. There's, there's uh, meter, which is the beat. There's melody, which is the tune. And there's message, which is the truth that a song must communicate to its audience in order to be universally appealing. We, we look to music as a source of inspiration and also of guidance. When my generation waited for the next Beatles album, it wasn't just to get our uh, mathematical minds tickled. It was to find out what to do next. We were in the height of the Vietnam War, and these artists rose up and sang out against that horrible, horrible, unnecessary, evil, war, which is no less or more terrible than the one we're engaged in now for all the wrong reasons. 
What shocks me is that the young artists of your generation aren't singing out against this war, against this uh, corruption of your government, uh, against this dilution, dilution of your constitution. And um, I don't want to get off on a political rant because I have this whole thing about teaching where I, I have what I call the eighth deadly sin, which is, uh, you know, I know you tried the other seven and you love them, but the eighth deadly sin is... Um, Theopolyclassism. And so I tell my class, I'm not going to discuss religion in here because it's too juicy and we'll waste all our time. There's only one religion in my classroom, and that is showbiz, and there's only one God, that's Elvis. <laughs> Poly stands for politics. My pet peeve is religion and politics, so Theopoly, you can start to see where I'm coming from. Um, but we don't discuss politics. And we don't discuss classism. Uh, the, the most evil thing we have on our planet is racism. The idea that any one of us is different than any other is absolutely absurd. There is um, one chromosome difference between us and a chimpanzee. There are no chromosome difference between any human beings. Color, locale, culture, whatever, none. So what it means is we're all the same. And uh, I love to... Um, uh, demonstrate this with a black student because uh, I call them up and I say, give me your hand and I hold up their hand and I hold up mine. And if you look at the palms of black people's hands, they're white. We're the same. The guy has a better tan than me, okay. <laughs> you know, but we are the same. And, and people who don't believe that or know that are, are missing something and you will be less of a human being if you carry around that idea. And a lot of people do. So I challenge you to defeat that. Now, I'm proud of your generation because you're far less racist than mine. And my father's generation, terribly racist. But this has got to go. But we're off subject, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm glad I got it in, though, because I, I, you need to know this. So it, uh, it all starts in the mind. And um, so I'm going to show you a little demonstration. I, I, scratch, I mean, this is ugly, but it'll get the point across. <laughs> Um, I'll show you how the mind works because this is the creative process and to be an entrepreneur you have to be a creative person you have to be spontaneous and flexible and ingenious now don't think that ingenious is beyond you because the I, I've drawn up here this symbol what's this called what's this called <coughs> yin yin wrong Yin yang is two things. This is one thing. It is called the Tao. T A O, the Tao. It is a thousands and thousands of years old symbol. It, it was emanating from ancient China, and it is a symbol of man living in harmony with the universe, something we obviously are not doing today. The greatest cultures on the planet in the history of the world have been based on this idea which essentially says that the world consists of complementary opposites evolving in and out of each other constantly. It also says that in the deepest, darkest place, there is light. And in the brightest place, there is darkness. It says that nothing exists without its opposite. And therefore, we do not live in a universe of dualities. We live in a universe of singularity, one thing. Nothing exists without its opposite. And therefore, the two combined are one thing. And everything is combined and attached. So what this represents here in the terms of tonight's conversation is about choices. Your life, when you can look back on a 50-year career as I can, and uh, I look at what happened, I realize that what occurred was a result of the choices I made. Now there are, is, this also says that there are no absolutes. There is no perfection on the earthly plane. Zero. Nothing is perfect. And that's demonstrated by the dots. The dots show you that as soon as something approaches its thickest, fattest place, it starts to become its opposite. Everything living is dying, everything dying is coming to life. Okay, so it means that 
the goal is to make the right choice. Always. And guess what? You're never going to always make the right choice because there's no perfection. What you're going to do and what this symbol represents is harmony and balance. The goal in life is to achieve harmony and balance with the natural order of things. So the choices you make are going to fall not in the yin fat part or the yang fat part, but somewhere in between, along this line in the middle where the balance occurs. So your careers, your any pursuit, is really based on a series of errors and corrections. A rocket heading toward a target moves out of range and back and forth, and it, it alters its thing by making mistakes and correcting them, and it hits the target. Your achievement of goals is directly attached to your ability to center and balance your effort, and also to stay in motion. If you're riding a bicycle, as long as you're in motion, your balance and your harmony and your rhythm uh, with the physics is fine. You stay on track, you can control it, you keep going. When you stop, you're going to fall. Or you have to brace it up or support it in some other way. So the idea of choice is why the uh, Tao is up there today. Let's go to the mind. The ancient Taoists said that we are all drops in the ocean of mind and that each of us contains the whole. The theory of the holographic universe today, a lot of modern scientists say the same thing in a whole other way. If that's true, and you attach it to another scientific idea that I, I was um, uh, told I could quote Amin today and use this as a demonstration point, who's a physics a major here. Uh, we are not only all drops in the ocean of mind, but each drop contains the whole and there is no time-space continuum. If there's no time-space continuum, then every idea, invention, thought, story, song, ever possible, exists right now somewhere. I suggest that that exists in our collective minds, the one mind that attaches us all together as individual computers in the big mainframe in the sky. Now, once that happens, and th if there's no time-space continuum and all thought exists now, that means that you, as a component, a drop in that ocean, contain the whole. Therefore, you are a bona fide genius right now, each and every one of you. Good work. Congratulations. So if all these ideas exist, and you, the, the uh, circle represents the one mind. The, the uh, psychologist Jung called this the collective consciousness. The visionary Edgar Cayce called it the Akashic Records. These are old ideas, they're not mine. But let's assume they're true, because it's way better than the current theories anyway. So this is, this is a, a nice way to look at the reality of the universe, and it reinforces your ability to succeed in business. Okay. So the one mind is full of all thoughts possible. And believe it or not, you don't have thoughts. They have you. They already exist in every way, and you're part of it. You contain all of them. So they're kind of raining at you. And when you see color and motion and action and stuff, you're getting all this data. And these are all thoughts coming at you. Oh, she's pretty. Oh, he's not. Whatever. And, and you are, are responding. Your mind, this computer is grabbing this data and sorting it out and do stuff. Okay, so it, let's say that we want to create a business. Well, the first thing that is important is to find a business that where you're not catching up with an existing thing. Find something that has to be created from scratch. Find something that's not being done and, and attach it to something that's failing. Something that's running out or crashing and burning or dissolving of its own uh, weight. Come up with that idea and take it into your individual mind, represented by this triangle, and digest it and ruminate on it and consider it and discuss it and meditate on it and figure out uh, a plan. How am I going to take this idea and turn it into a product, something that can be marketed, distributed, and sold for profit? 
Now, in 1946, a young physics pr professor named Bohm came to his mentor and said, uh, I got a new theory of the universe. And he came up with this theory that ultimately is now projected as the theory of the holographic universe. And his mentor said, no, it can't be. And Bohm says, uh, what do you mean can't be? He says, well, in order for you to be right, I have to be wrong. And I'm Albert Einstein. Who the hell are you? And Bohm didn't uh, accept his mentor's opinion. And he went on and he considered uh, this thesis and developed it and stuck it out there. And a lot of scientists, uh, scientists embraced it immediately, and a lot of them laughed and walked away. Uh, it's still around, and it's growing all the time. And if it isn't how the world is, it, it's how it ought to be. And it, and it relates to this very same ancient idea that we are all containing the whole. So here in your infant imagination, governed by your conscience, which tells you the difference between right and wrong, and believe me, you always know what's right and wrong. You may say, oh, I didn't know it was wrong, and do it anyway. Well, you knew it was wrong, and you did it anyway, and that's okay. That's your choice. Uh, your life is about your choices, and that's the great thing about being free, is that you get to make your choices, good or bad. Good for you, or bad for others, or any combination thereof. You also are governed here by your emotions. The passion, excitement, the fear, the joy, the, the elements that you put into any activity that you pursue. So what, what Bohm eventually did was prove Einstein wrong. Einstein based his uh, negation of it on the idea that something, that nothing travels faster than the speed of light. Well, it's since been proved that something does travel faster than the speed of light, and that is thought, which is immediate and instant and does not travel at all. You got it. If someone threw a grenade on this stage, we'd all know at the same precise moment. We wouldn't have to think about it. It wouldn't take light years. It would happen because there's the grenade, and it's fewn, and it's going to go up. We'd all be heading for the door or the floor. So thoughts rain into your imagination, and through willpower, you have to overcome the instinctive resistance of your body, represented by the square. Your body doesn't want to go out and work. Hello, your body wants to uh, consume, propagate, contend, and be entertained. The old couch potato thing. So what happens is here is that you have to, uh, as a, to be a winner, you have to close the mind-body gap. The mind-body gap is demonstrated by the fact that the body resists your will to make stuff happen, to go into action. If you don't go into action, there will be a consequence. But it will be a consequence dictated by fate. If you do take action and you close the mind-body gap and you force your body to get off the couch and go down to the office and do the pitch that will get you the funding or create the staff or do the other things that are involved in making a business uh, grow and be successful, then you are not leaving the consequence up to fate. You are creating your own destiny. Okay, so now, see those pictures over there? This here, we're dealing with mind, body, and spirit here, okay? And this is the couch potato body. This thick square that's slow, fat, and ugly, okay? This is your mind here, all fuzzy. And this is your spirit, tiny. But you're getting entertained, and you're getting consumed, and you're doing your sex, and you're having a good time, and a lot of people do this. As a matter of fact, most people do this. That's why they're not entrepreneurs. They're couch potatoes. They have a job. It gets them enough to pay for the couch and pay for the potatoes. So uh, who would you rather be, this guy, or have this image of your mind-body-spirit connection? A slim, you know, active, fast body a precise mind and a giant spirit, okay? Now you choose, which do you want to be? And I don't even have to add, that's a rhetorical question because I know which one you want to be. You don't want to be couch potato, you want to be a winner. You want to be a person who goes out there and takes action on your imaginary nourished goals to achieve success. Because that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to come here, you know, there's not a lot of meaning to life, I don't know if you're aware of this, but life is basically empty and meaningless. <laughs> And it's what you put into that icebox that makes you unique and special and gives your life purpose. So the bottom line is, this is what you have to do. You have to close the mind-body gap. When the, when the body rules and the arrows point this way, you're this guy. 
when your mind rules and you take action, you're this guy. This guy's a winner. This guy's not. That's how the mind works, OK? So now, let's take that idea and apply it to show business. Show business is really the most fun place in the world. I swear, I've been everywhere. I've done lots of stuff. This is the place where more fun goes down, more creative thrills are had, more media explosions are experienced and wondered. And, it, and it's a phenomenal place. And it also has that wonderful uh, golden ring where you, no matter how tough it is, I have never met, in, in 50 years in the business, I have never met an artist that didn't think he was going to go all the way to the big top. This is the big top. This is where Madonna lives, Dr. Dre, Jay-Z, um, you too. You know, the really successful artists live in the big top. They can do whatever they want. Neil Young. You know, this is, this is guys who are, uh, have re reaped the two rewards of success in entertainment. They are rich and they are famous. And you may be humble and sweet and not want to be famous, okay? Um, lots of people don't want to be famous. But in some way, some little secret way, we all do. And that's evidenced by what we call reality TV, uh, which is, uh, you know, dominating the airwaves or the broadcast waves these days. And um, reality TV, believe it or not, is not the product of some uh, network genius coming up with, okay, we're going to create reality TV. It is, it is not that at all. What it is is the natural evolution of entertainment. And it really started with Vietnam War. That war, unlike this one, was all over the TV every night. I mean, you were in the jungle, the blood, the stuff, it was going off. Fire, steel, flying everywhere. And people were like glued to this horror every night. Then, uh, when that was over, the next really big reality TV was the OJ trial. I mean, everybody stayed home and from work and watched the OJ trial. It was just the most fascinating thing ever. And then uh, that evolved into the um, revival of uh, old game shows. And, and uh, it, it led through a myriad of processes. And ultimately, what are we, what's the biggest show on TV? American Idol. A talent contest, rigged at that. <laughs> so um, getting to the big top is the goal in showbiz. This is a, a map of showbiz, how to play the game. And, and here's how it's played. It's played by, this is the artist level. The object of the game is to get the artist up the elevator through the money sphere to the big top. Simple board game, <laughs> OK? Get up the money sphere. Through, up the elevator, through the money sphere to the big top. Now, this is the artist level. I also notice that there's no door to the elevator. How am I going to play? <laughs> well, you have to build a team of players. And the way to get to the top is to get on, the only way you get on the elevator is to join a player who's already on. And this is why artists seek personal manager. So this artist level, Look at how little of the money sphere touches the artist level. What this says is that 100% of the money is made by 10% of the artists. These are lousy odds. <laughs> because that means 90% of these people are going to make nothing. Well, that's OK in a way, because um, artists are anybody who says he's an artist. I'm a screenwriter. I've written four screenplays. I've never had a movie made. Well, I produced a movie, but I never had one based on my own material. But I'm allowed to call myself a writer because I can hand you the scripts and say, I wrote this stuff. And frankly, I think you'll love it. <laughs> uh, I do. <laughs> but anyway, um, the artist has to get on the elevator. And he has to get on with someone who's already on. And the guy he goes to is the manager. And look how m the, much of a percentage of increase in money r lives on the manager realm. It, your odds of being, uh, making money are now greatly different. They've increased enormously. The manager's job is to get the artist an agent. Look how much of the agent level is money. It's all about the money. And an agent's job is to bridge the artist-manager situation to the producers, which is where most of the money is. Now, the producer is a broad term. It, it's the movie studio. It's the recording company. It's the television network. It's the game show manufacturer. It's, it's whatever um, entity funds the practice. So here we have what we call, I call the uh, four primary professions of entertainment, artists, managers, agents, and producers. This whole thing is a map of showbiz. And if you read it from the bottom up, it says a map. 
No, I'm not, I'm not lying. Now, there are also three ancillary players and an eighth profession. This is the ancient team. This goes back to the caves and the logs and the chickens at the door. Those four guys have been doing this for millennia. <laughs> and it's around their actions that the rest of the industry is born. So because they do what they do, there are these three other professions. Publicists, whose job it is to take the story that the artisan manager create about what they're doing and who they are and what their um, greatness, however it could be described, might be, and uh, communicate it to the media through print, through television, movies, all forms of mass media, uh, internet now bigger and more easily accessed than ever, than any other form. But the publicist tells the story. He, he is an ancillary profession because without these guys doing what they do, he has nothing to do. There's nothing to talk about. There's no story to communicate. Now, back in the cave days, there were, they, they didn't have accountants. It wasn't that hard to count a dozen chickens, and everybody you know, had to contain them, and they knew what they were. And, and they, even if they were you know, killing them to get some giblets uh, as commissions, basically, um, they didn't have an accountant. But in modern day showbiz, accountants are very important. They're responsible for the money, which isn't just about the income streams that accrue to the action, but it's about the taxes and the insurance and the, the uh, payment to this crew and the staff and so forth. So it's a very important function, and um, it is also the area where most artist-manager relationships breach. Most artist-manager relationships end because the manager misappropriated the money. Now, throughout my, year, uh, my years as a manager, I, I didn't face this problem because I never handled the artist's money. I was aware of this possibility, and I did not want the responsibility, so I got an accountant right out of the box. The money goes to the accountant. I trust that the accountant will pay me my 15% commission, and he'll just pay the artist's bills and expenses and uh, deliver the, uh, the rest to the tax man. But very important function in, in a, the second ancillary position. The third cornerstone of this game in the ancillary aspect is lawyers. Lawyers who are the um, gentlemen sometimes who arrange and connect the array of contracts that govern the various activities of the record company from the agency agreement to the record company agreement to um, a production agreement with a either live event producer, promoter, or a record producer. There, there's a lot of contracts involved. There's also a contract for every personal appearance that the agent is precipitating. So you need a lawyer to keep track of all this stuff and make sure that they don't conflict with each other, that one contract does not negate some aspect of the other. So very vital at part, player on the team. The fourth ancillary uh, player, who I call the, the eighth profession, is the crew. In music, the head of the crew is called the road manager. If the attendance gets high enough and the gross is big enough, they call him the tour manager. Just like the accountant, if you're dealing with more money, becomes the business manager. These are appellations that they covet, and it is a step up above their CPA category or their uh, mouthpiece appellation. So, so these guys are vital to the game. And here we have the eight players. And what this image is, is if you stood in the big top and looked down the elevator shaft toward the black hole of broken dreams. That's where these 90% end up. They, get, they don't get, uh, fight their way up against the gravity that is in the elevator. They get sucked down the black hole and end up at rock bottom. But don't worry. Uh, and this is what I call slipping and sliding this downward arrow. You slip and slide right out of the biz. Okay? But don't worry, there's the comeback trail, which is the arrow going back. So this is how you play the game, and the activity is inspired by your willpower and desire to get to the big top, and you have th this gravity in the, in the elevator shaft. It's like the status quo in any industry. The people in power do not want to surrender that power or that income to the new guy, you. So they resist your presence. They don't want you on a damn elevator, 
Okay? They don't want you in the way, and they don't want you taking any money or any time. So get out of here. And that's their attitude. So it takes a certain amount of talent to inspire someone already on the elevator. By the way, this is the black hole looking from above. To inspire these guys to take on your talent and exploit their um, careers, risk and invest their time and energy and money and career on your career, they have to believe in you. They have to have confidence in your skills. Now, it's a, the entire thing is called the talent business. It's about talent. And talent is not unlike um, Justice uh, Scalia's dissertation on pornography. And this is probably the only thing I agree with Justice Scalia on, period. But um, he said that I can't describe pornography to you, but I know it when I see it. Okay, well, that's how talent works. You can't really describe it, but when you see it, you know it. You know you saw something great or good or whatever your um, criterion for quality can attach to it. So it's in the, the competition in this environment is about that very thing. Because theoretically, the great talent will succeed. The great talent will uh, swim upstream past the, the rocks and the rapids and the fish hooks and the bears and everything that's going to get in the way and try to preclude your success. You're going to, through willpower and through determination and through never, never giving up, you might have a shot at competing for a place in the big top. So the way that you um, drive yourself up through this process is by reaching for Elvis land. Now, perennially, Elvis Presley is the biggest grossing dead guy. He makes more money now, some 30 years after his death, than he did when he was alive. Bec through marketing and merchandising and exploitation of his extant product and, and uh, the whole system of tours at Graceland and you name it. Elvis Presley makes a ton of dough every year. Now, Colonel Parker told me as a young man, when I asked him what was the object of personal management, he told me that the object of personal management was to create duration in the act. Well, I have to tell you that 30 years later, he's making more money than when he started out or when he peaked in his success. That is duration. That is longevity. That is the most successful career in music. So if you want to be the next big thing, what you have to do is knock him out of the box. You have to become bigger than Elvis. Good luck. This business is not going to accommodate that kind of growth in its current form. The postmodern record business has been cut to its knees by the internet and by your willingness to appropriate music. <laughs> okay? And uh, the good news is that that same instrument of the internet is going to be the tool that carves the future. The future marketing of music. The record business is only 100 years old. It's not shocking that it should disappear because it made all of its growth advancements through the introduction of new technologies. And here it comes again. The internet, the biggest new technology in 100 years, probably since the steam engine, uh, it's going to change everything. And so as the business crumbles, uh, there was a major, major error made by the postmodern record business, and that was when Napster came along. If the big four record companies, Universal Music Group, Warner Brothers Music, EMI, and Sony BMG, if they had just embraced this technology some seven years ago and said, wow, if they had had some vision, just a little bit, and they had signed that up, bought it, anything, whatever, but got to implement it into the process of selling recorded music, they would not be crashing and burning today. Well, because they are, and the postmodern record era is over, this has created a whole new phenomenon. And this requires a reinvention and a remonetization of how music is sold. Now remember, it's been going on for thousands of years. The death of the record business is not the death of the music business. As a matter of fact, with the advent of the iPod, 
and your ability to have 10,000 songs in your pocket, music's bigger than ever. More genres uh, are exposed to more people constantly, on demand, the one you want. You don't need to buy the, the 10 songs in the album to get the 11th song that you actually wanted. You, if you're going to steal, you're not going to steal a whole album unless you love it. You're going to steal the song you love. So it's changed the dynamic. And it's really gone right back to where it was in the beginning, where um, in the antiquarian record industry, a Frank Sinatra or a Bing Crosby sold one song at a time. And an album was, uh, you know, half a dozen big 78 heavy, brittle uh, recordings that uh, were inserted into a paper sleeve inside a little book, like a photograph album. And that was where the term album came from. But those were uh, made one song at a time. And that's what it's going to come back to again. Nobody who's going to steal something they don't want. And uh, every song that an artist writes is not a crystal tear from the eye of Zeus. As a matter of fact, most of them suck. I mean, suck badly. So the creative skill of a Paul McCartney, a John Lennon, um, many of the great songwriters who, who wrote the material in the postmodern era, uh, these people are not being replaced. Negative feedback occurs to all of us, and I'll just name them, I won't explain them. Frustration, aggression, insecurity, loneliness, uncertainty, resentment, and emptiness. These are things that occur in all of our minds, and they deter our progress. So when they pop up, consider them as a warning signal and go discover and fix the problem. Do not dwell on them because they will become what you're doing. Your mind cannot tell the difference between an actual experience and a vividly imagined experience. So remember your successes. Burn those into your brain. Repeat them. Play that movie over and again how you won. And create win-win situations. And you'll have a successful career and your entrepreneuring enterprises will make you at least a profit and inure to your survival. I'm sorry I went over time, but it was really great to talk to you, and thanks so much for the opportunity. <laughs>